certainly hope all of you are interested to hear the old, old story again, because we will be talking about that. But uh, it's a blessing to be here. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to all. The video is going to say it, and we probably say it every time we get up here, but it isn't enough as far as we go. We just feel like we wish we could express it in a way that it is down here, you know, in a, in a way that's a lot deeper than words can express. Uh, but uh, it's a blessing to be here. There were some challenges on the way uh, getting to this point. We were looking forward to coming, and things were going well. And for some reason, three months ago, from having about a stable, uh, f- there were about 40 faithful people. You could count on them being there if no one else was. And all of a sudden, it was 10. And then I said, well, it's just a bad Sunday. And then it was 15, and then it was 10, and it was 15. And this went on for two months. And I'm like, I'm going to the U.S., and... I don't know what's going on, and I think COVID scare was part of it because it hit our area again strong and, and other things, but then uh, I started, it started to gradually grow again, and we had about 35 on, on Sunday before coming here. We had a young marriage get married just last Sunday, so it was a privilege. They said, don't go. We're going to get baptized before you go. If not, we're going to have to wait till November, so I was like, let's do it, and so we got the uh, baptistry filled up with water and got that done. One more thing on the list. But it was a blessing to be able to do that. And then uh, the complication was around who would cover me for that time. I, I know a church planter down there in Mexico just finished handing a church over to a local pastor. And I was like, he's free. This will be perfect. I've known him 15 years. I know where he stands. And all of a sudden, I get in contact with him. And he's going to Mexico City because a pastor just had brain surgery. And he's covering for him. This pastor's up in age, and they don't know when it will be all finalized. And they're like, well, there goes that. So I got in contact with some pastors about two and a half hours away, which is almost the closest you can get for any good church. And uh, they said, You'll go one, he'll go this week, and I'll go that week, and we'll get it done until you get back. Shortly later, one told me I can't do it. Emergency came up, and I was like, okay. First pastor that went to Mexico City calls me back and says, uh, brother, uh, the pastor's back. He's been healing phenomenally well, and so I'm going to be able to do that. Five days ago, he calls me and says I'm COVID positive. So, <laughs> so it was one thing after another. He had been about, I don't know, five or six days sick when he called me. He said I finally took the test. He said I could probably be there uh, the, the first Sunday of October, and I told him, you know what, with the scare, I've seen how some people reacted. I think you might want to wait till the next one. And I got someone there in, in the church to take care of this Sunday, and I'm praying right now. Things are going well, but uh, he will be in next Sunday. Just just pray. Things lined out, but it was, it was an interesting journey until then. I'm going to let the video kind of just present some of what we're doing down there, and it's, I slapped it together, among other things I had to do before coming. But uh, any questions, I would be glad to ask there in the entrance. Also, if you do not have, if you've not gone for our prayer card, please go get it. If you have our old prayer card, it was our family was has now doubled, so you might want to get the new prayer card. We got two new ones there, and they definitely need prayer. And so <laughs> we're thankful for your prayer. But uh, please do pick up another one. We have plenty to go around, so uh, they're back there on the floor. But I'll let the video go ahead and, and share a little bit of what we're doing. If the devil took over a town, what would it look like? We'd probably assume it would be a place of outright open sinfulness. And certainly that is one of the devil's weapons. But on the flip side, he is an angel of light. And where he reigns, there will be false light. But light nonetheless. If one goes to the highland of Jalisco, they will find huge temples that are often full of radically religious people. Oh, they have morality, but it's not in dependence upon what Christ did on the cross. It is not in dependence upon God. They have zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. In Arandas, they have the biggest bell in all of Latin America, which they ring proudly in honor of their idols. In several of the temples, they have monks and nuns who take turns chanting every hour of the day and night for 365 days of the year nonstop. They have tens of thousands of people walking for hundreds of miles to this region from every state surrounding it as a sacrifice or a means of gaining favor with the Virgin Mary. Or they also do it as a service of gratitude for some miracle they say she has done for them. They have people walking down the street every day ringing a little bell, and that's to remind you that you're supposed to stop, bow, and also chant. 
if you don't, they often might look at you wrong or they might ring it in your face. They have some of the most well-known seminaries in the country for training new priests and nuns. You see, it is many times harder to work with people who have their own righteousness than those who know they are sinners. Now, they don't persecute us much, but if one of their own converts to Christ, their family is often their worst enemy. The worst thing they have done to us is verbally attack us. They've not wanted to rent to us, especially if we were going to use it for church. They have sprinkled me with holy water on the streets. I don't know if they thought it was going to melt, but it didn't happen. It just refreshed me. We have people who have their priests tell them just to stay away from us. But the people of the area who convert to Christ will be treated very badly. Some have been threatened to lose their jobs, and sometimes they do. Some have been told that they will have zero inheritance in the family. They are dead to their family. One 78-year-old widow almost was kicked out of her house when we baptized her. One man in our church who was a drunk, he, he comes to Christ and he stops drinking, and his father told him, I prefer the drunk version of you than the Christian version of you. The reason for this is that we are in the dead center of what some call the circle of silence, the most unevangelized part of Mexico, where according to polls in the entire region, there is not one municipality that has even 1% of Christian presence. But this doesn't mean God has not been working. We have been praying and we know you have been praying with us and God has heard our prayers. Many people are deciding to leave the false light of mere religiosity and to turn to the one who is the true light of this world. We disciple the new believers and God works on their heart for them to get baptized and that's a huge step for them to get baptized. It's like turning their back on everything they were, had learned previously and that comes with great resistance as well. As for the two mission works, in San Miguel del Alto, the small congregation is learning to grow little by little. All of the believers in the San Miguel mission are brand new babies in Christ and been born again since we've been there. That means they have a lot of growth to do and there are many things they're still battling with. Please pray for them. In Arandas, we arrived and there were about 11, 12, 13 people gathering together every week with no leadership. And they asked us to come help. And over the time, God is blessed. And now we've even had Sundays that have gotten up to 60 people. Though, of course, the faithful are fewer. And they're fighting to grow and they're under attack. But God is working. Arandas Church is even beginning to start supporting missions themselves. And that's a huge blessing as you get to see the heart of missions moving on to a new congregation and replicating the lives of the people. Now we continue to need your prayers and we are ever indebted for your support. There have been times we have felt like giving up, but God has sustained us through it. We pray and ask you to continue to pray with us as we fight for this land. We are the Ortiz family serving God in the highlands of Jalisco, Mexico. Thank you so much for standing behind us and helping us do this work for the Lord. Well, uh, five minutes of video will not show everything there is to be seen, but hopefully it will perk your out curiosity to ask any questions farther beyond that. Um, we do live in an area that is, is uh, known for uh, the Christarian, I'm just going to try and half translate that, Cristero War, Christarian War, which was a war for the authority of the Catholic Church because they didn't like it when the government tried to make decisions in those areas. And so there was uh, a time where the government sent soldiers there to fight the people who were defending Christ's cause, which meant the church's authority. And it, uh, it ended up lasting about 10 years now. So few years back, but that is still rooted in a lot of the people. Some of the grandparents there are, are people who were alive during those times, and it's a strong strong area. We had this last Sunday, one of the brothers, not Christian brothers, but one of the brothers of a sister who is a sister in Christ showed up to church to argue with him after service and cussed her out as, as he left right as people were coming out of service, and uh, that type of thing isn't super common, but 
but mainly we find that the persecution is on the people and uh, not so much on us. We've had a few things, but it's really on them from their families. And uh, also on the flip side of it, our church has uh, $900 promised in uh, faith promise this year, which is a, a huge blessing. I feel like we're moving somewhere when I saw that. And uh, the church is getting that burden as well. And we're so glad that you guys have been behind us because that really, that really holds us up. Your prayers, we know and that, that people are praying for us, it means so much more than I could express at this moment. But anyway, uh, I would like to introduce a little bit of a background story to, to a certain person. And then we'll look up the text for scripture tonight. And that is, I want to talk about two missionaries. Two missionaries. I want to talk about their trips, their targets, and their tactics. Two missionaries, their trips, their targets, and their tra- tactics. But I'm going to start with a true story. There once was this young lady who, like many young ladies of her age, she dreamed of getting married and finding that perfect husband and the satisfaction that would come through that. And soon enough, a man came around who seemed to have all the qualities she was looking for, and, and things moved on. They, they made arrangements for marriage, and they got married. But like all marriages, trials come. And the trials started coming in as, as time went by, and they started growing. And the problem was no one wanted to deal with the problem. So eventually, they were at each other's throats, and they finally decided, you know what, we're going to dissolve this marriage, and they got divorced. So the young lady thought, you know, maybe I just jumped the gun. You know, Maybe I should have waited. And another man came into her life who seemed to have all the qualities that the first man did not have. And, and she said, this is it. I just, I just jumped the gun. That was my mistake. And so, again, she gets married. And as time goes by, new problems start coming out. And different problems. But, again, they didn't want to resolve the problems. So, after a time, they ended up divorcing. Her heart was broken. She kind of felt like giving up altogether. But, soon enough, another man was interested in her. So, she thought to herself, you know, I know the process. If this doesn't work out, I can divorce him too. She gets married. And she divorces again. And she gets married again. And she divorces again. And she gets married again for the fifth time. And she divorces again. She finally decides, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to live with someone. This getting married stuff isn't worth it. Now, if you want to find out this story, it's in John chapter 4. Uh, it's a story you probably already recognize at this point. But I want to tell you that this lady eventually did find a man who changed her life. And it wasn't through marriage, but it was through a relationship. And if you turn there, you'll find a little bit of this story. But I also want to give a little bit more background before I move into this. If you went to chapter 3 of John, you could could make this outline. You could preach this outline. Chapter 3 has the must of the sinner. You must be born again. Then it has the must of the Savior. He must be lifted up. In other words, crucified. It follows farther down in the chapter the must of a servant. He must increase But I must decrease. And you come into chapter 4, and there's a couple more must throughout John. But in chapter 4, towards uh, the latter part of the conversation with the Samaritan woman, he gives the must of the worshiper. You must worship in in, in spirit and truth. And so these musts are very interesting. But I want to focus specifically in chapter 4 on the must of the missionary. Chapter 4, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4 says... And he must needs go through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. When a missionary is burdened for a field, it becomes a must. And Jesus does this must in this chapter. And we're going to study a little bit into it. We're going to kind of fly over the top of a lot of details here. But I hope to bring out at least three things about these two missionaries we're going to talk about. But first, let's pray and ask the Lord's guidance. Dear God, I pray that you would direct today... This message, Lord, you know that when coming back to the U.S., often it takes me a couple days to get my, my mind back in English, and, and therefore I will probably stumble over or half translate words. But Lord, I, what I really am concerned about, God, is that the message be clear. Whether the messenger fumbles, Lord, let the message be powerful. I pray you would convict each one of us, Lord, anew from these stories, from your word, and that we would be burdened and our heart would grow and that we would enjoy again the old old story as we hear it again and again lord it will be our theme and glory 
And we're thankful that we get to share that theme over and over again in this world. Lord, I pray for this church and their impact in this community, God, that it would be one that continues to show, sow your seed throughout all the, the areas around here, Lord, and that you add the increase as time goes. Lord, I've seen you bless this church from now 10 years back until now, Lord, and I've just seen your hand, and I pray your hand would continue to work. Thank you, Lord, again for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Very good. Well, we're going to talk about two missionaries. We're going to talk about their trip we're going to talk about their targets, and we're going to talk about their tactics. So let's just start with the greatest missionary of all time. The greatest missionary of all times. If Spurgeon is called the prince of preachers, this is definitely the king of preachers. We're talking about Jesus himself. Chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 introduces us to Jesus' trip. He's a missionary from the point he comes down from heaven to earth. And that is a bigger sacrifice than any other missionary has ever done. But he goes beyond that, right? He goes from heaven and he comes down to a, a, a manger and he moves through this world and he ends up on a cross. That really is an amazing example of missionary work. But in this case, he has a trip specifically to a place of Samaria. It's, it says there, Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. The location where Jesus is going through is Samaria. And you probably heard this if you've been in church for a while, but the Samaritans and the Jews, didn't, they didn't get along. And that's an understatement. They would literally travel the long route to get to the northern part of the country. They would cross the Jordan, travel the other side, and then recross the Jordan in order to avoid it. I assure you, when we came up from Mexico in a car, we came the fastest route we knew of. We weren't planning on taking any detours. But these people said, you know what, we can lose a day, but we don't want to deal with the Samaritans. And so they would travel around this area and avoid them. And if you want to know how grievous the situation was, all you have to do is see how the apostles responded when Jesus was in that area. And they said, do you want us just to call fire down and burn them all up? You know, you're like, whoa, calm down. There are people there. There, there are children there. No, just burn them up. And, and, and you see that as an expression of a real problem in their time, a racist problem they had in that time. And Jesus, of course, to that answer, that famous verse, the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And praise the Lord, Samaria ends up being a big part of the Acts um, uh, Evangelism Mission Project. And as it moves through Samaria, many people are saved. But the reason they had this animosity was because in those areas, Samaria had spent many now, uh, many centuries that they had been mixing with the cultures around, mixing uh, as far as marriage was, and, and they ended up adopting some very pagan practices. They ended up shaping Judaism to their convenience, and this just drove a divide between them that was even greater. In the end, they were heretics, they were mixed, they were, they were the worst of the worst. To call a Jew a Samaritan was very, very mean. And I assume that to call a Samaritan a Jew would have been equally evil, though I don't know of a verse that points that out. In this case, the Samaritan woman will call Jesus a Jew in a second. But this is his, this is his trip. Let's see his target. Verse 7 says, Then cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. A woman of Samaria to draw water. This is his target. Now, we already talked about her story at the start. This is the woman I was presenting you. She is coming at the sixth hour of the day. And the Bible doesn't specifically say why. And it's dangerous to assume and then dogmatically state why. But I, I think we could run through some theories. And some people speculate that the reason she was there at the worst hour of the day, the sixth hour, if you're using the Jewish reckoning of time or the Roman reckoning of time, is still the hottest part of the day and in a place that no one in their right mind would be getting water. Therefore... It seemed really odd that she was there at that time. And, and the Bible points that out, kind of capturing your attention. Like, wh why, why at the sixth hour? Now, going into a little bit of a speculation, some people have assumed, and it makes a lot of sense, that she was there at that hour because that would be when no one else would be there. And if you had her life, wouldn't that make sense? Five marriages? I, I, as I told the story, some were like, wait, wait. Again and again and again. It, and we just told it in a quick flyby. 
But to know that was her life, you can imagine that there was a lot of bullying. You can imagine that there was a lot of, of mean jokes. Hey, I think she's looking at your brother. She's interested in your brother. You better run. And, you know, the whole laugh and the, the, the whole, whole, whole thing was, could have been so, so harsh on this woman. She finally decided, you know what, I'm going to go at the worst hour of the day so that I don't have to deal with people. I'd rather deal with the blistering sun. Now, that is speculation, but without that speculation, I don't think it's hard to tell. This woman was not a satisfied woman. This woman was not living an abundant life. This woman was living in a dry, thirsty, spiritual state. And yet, that is exactly why Jesus is there. Jesus is there because he's there for Nicodemus, the chapter before the Pharisee of Pharisees. But he's also there for the Samaritan of Samaritans. And he's there for the one who thinks they're too good to be saved, or to need to be saved, and he's there for the person who thinks they're too bad to be saved. And those two extremes are addressed in just two chapters. But you see, he goes by and he visits her. So we see the trip, we see his uh, target, and now I want to focus on his tactic. In the end of that same verse we just read, said, Jesus saith unto her, verse 7, give me to drink, give me to drink. Now, Jesus, of course, is the embodiment of the gospel. I mean, if someone's going to present the gospel well, it's going to be him. He lives the gospel. He is the gospel. And he presents the gospel so clearly. So he, he, he talks to an elderly, elderly man, and he says, you need to be born again. That's the one thing he cannot do. And he's in a crowd that's hungry, and there's no food. And he says, I am the bread of life. And he knew how to take a conversation from the physical and move it into the spiritual without any friction along the way. You're, you're, you're surprised often when reading the gospel how quickly he moved to such a spiritual conversation. And he does so here again with this woman. He starts with a physical conversation. And of course, the woman realizes this is odd. Then saith the woman, verse 9 of Samaria, Unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh, asketh, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. It's, it's, it's a straight up fact to her. This is, this is really weird. You're doing what is countercultural. But Jesus doesn't let the conversation fall apart. Instead of doing that, he brings her in even farther into the conversation by making this really interesting statement. He says, referring to verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water She has no idea she is talking to the creator of all races, or might I say, of one race, because we're all of one blood. And he does not, he is not a respecter of persons, so he's interested in her as much as anyone else. Though his ministry must start, according to prophecy and as scripture lays out, with the Jews, he was always interested in the Gentiles as well. And he was interested in her life just as much. But he uses this statement here that must have brought her two questions because that's exactly what we find farther along. Who are you and what do you offer? You say you, if you knew who I was, and then you say in what I want to give, okay, tell me who you are. And she seems to understand it has something to do with the water because she says in verse 11, the woman saith unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep from whence Then hast thou that living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Her questions are two. Who are you? And what do you offer? Certainly you cannot be offering something better than this well. And certainly you cannot be greater than Jacob. That's what she says. This well has been here for a millennium and a half, and people have eaten here generation after generation. They've been able to drink of this water. Their cattle have survived. This is living water. Now, that's pretty miraculous, don't you think? A well that lasts 1,500 years. There are wells that don't last 100 years. There are wells that the water goes bad. There are wells that collapse. So this is an amazing well. Might I add, this well still exists today and is an archaeological attraction because of that. The only problem is it's in a very dangerous area, so it's not studied as easily as one might want to. This seems to be living water. And Jacob is a patriarch. You certainly can't be better than him, and you certainly cannot have anything better than this. 
And then Jesus says this amazing statement, so profound. In verse 13 and 14, he says, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Whosoever drinketh, I don't know if he pointed, the Bible doesn't say. He said, of this water. There was a gesture in that direction, at least by words. But he's certainly speaking far beyond the well, right? He's talking to this woman's life. Her entire life is being addressed in this statement. And might I say, all of our lives without Christ. And everything this world has is addressed in that. He could point right through the well and say, everything this world offers you as far as drink goes will never satisfy the deepest thirst of your soul. Never. You look for popularity, young man, young woman. It won't satisfy. Do you look for riches, you who've got a business and it's thriving? It won't satisfy. What are you looking for to satisfy your soul? We have a triune hole in our soul that only God can fill. And that is what he's stating here. It's like going down to the fair and trying to buy that cotton candy type thing. This world is a lot like that. It looks huge. It looks great. You bite into it. Like, what did I buy? I could have bought a gum, you know, and it would have been the same thing. (laughs) Nothing will satisfy you in this life and fill that deeper longing. Now, there is a truth that for a time... We can be satisfied by this world. But even the rich man who was there with Lazarus, who was full in life, thirsted afterwards. So there will come a point we will realize that everything here is a broken cistern. Verse 14, he then says, equally profound. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Now, there's a phrase that's repeated twice in this verse. I don't know if you caught it. But I tell my church in Mexico, both mission churches, I tell them, always look for repetition in the Gospels. Jews repeated things as a a means of emphasis. And verily, verily, meant pay double attention to what I'm about to say. This is sure. This is true. But it's important. And in this verse, there are four words that are repeated twice. I'll read it again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. I shall give him. Again, so profound. This one singular phrase, if rightly understood, destroys, demolishes, completely annihilates any false understanding of salvation. I. The gospel tells us there is only one that can get us to the Father. I, it's not him, his mother, his apostles, his church, his ordinances, his sacraments. It's him. I shall give him. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is always speaking in a singular term as far as salvation goes. And then he says, shall give. It isn't I shall sell you. It isn't I shall make you work for. It's I shall give. Salvation is a gift. It's free for all. A few verses earlier, he had already said, if you would have asked him, he would have given it to you. That's all. I shall give him. I I think even him is interesting here because Jesus often addressing crowds would speak in, in, in personal pronouns. He would call out to one person. As if that were the only person there present. And I think he did that because the big difference. I mean in Mexico we have a lot of people. They're brought up in Catholicism. They know Jesus died for the world. They'll all tell you oh Jesus loves the world. Do you really know that he loves you? That's what I have to ask them. Do you realize it was your sins that he died for? That's the difference between a, 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 being that close to the gospel. And actually having the gospel. Understanding it's a personal savior we're talking about. I shall give him. And then he explains what this water shall do. It says the water will be a well springing up into eternal life. I mean, we could dig down and make another three sermons on that, but I won't do that tonight. But it says it shall be in him. If you have a well inside you, who can take it away? He plants the well inside the person. It shall spring up. We're not talking about stagnant water. 
here in Idaho, there's a lot of cow troughs. They, the cow will come and drink water, and it, according to how many liters it will drink, the, the floater will drop down, it will refill right back to where it was, right? You drink a water, you uh, a cup of water, you'll, you'll get a cup of water back in. This is not talking about just replenishing what you use. This is overabundant. This is, this is multiplying. This is gushing forth, overflowing, springing up water. It just keeps coming back and back, and in fact, a chapter two later, he says, it will be rivers of living water coming out of your soul. Why? Why do we need that much grace? I think it's because we are supposed to continue to share that same water with others as well. Into eternal life, it says. It doesn't say until you sin again. Then you have to go to confession. Then you have to do penitence. Then you have to mend. And then you have to donate. And you have to do other things. No, It is until eternal life, the blood flowing from Emmanuel's veins is until the end. It cleanses and cleanses and cleanses till we stand before God. Now the woman seems to get what he's talking about, but she hasn't understood exactly the spiritual aspect. She says in verse 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. Amen. But then she says, neither come hither to draw. Okay, you still haven't got it, right? And what Jesus does is he actually throws a twist in this entire conversation. A very surprising twist. He he had everything in order and all of a sudden he has to go out and bring up bad memories, right? Verse 16, go call thy husband, come hither. Have you ever asked why he said that? Why bring that up now? I mean, you got her where you want her. I think for multiple reasons. One, so we can analyze that not everybody who asks and is, is inquiring of salvation necessarily has understood it well enough to receive it. And, and we may need to ask and see how much they've actually understood. But I, I think beyond that is because there is no true conversion without true conviction. And this woman hasn't had conviction yet. Not a single sin in her life has been pointed out to this point. And so Jesus says, wait one second, go get your husband. This is the motion in Mexico, which means, ouch. You can use it when you get down there sometime. She answers with the shortest statement in the entire conversation. Uh, Maybe her problem and maybe why she got divorced so much was how many times she would argue with people. I don't know. But it says, after he says these words, that she says, "I, I have no husband. And I don't know if her face went down at that moment. But I think Jesus had another reason why he said this. Because grace is all the more beautiful when you understand that God offers it to you knowing who you are. Is that not true? She could have gone home and, and, and I mean, she's saved. If she's saved, she's saved. But the, the progress of salvation often takes time. Problems don't solve instantly. We lie to people. We say, get saved and all your problems are over. Sometimes they get worse. In and, and, and Los Altos de Jalisco, they get worse most of the time. So we have to tell them, your problems might get worse. But... God is with you. And she might have got home and maybe she had kids. With, the Bible doesn't tell us she had kids with these five husbands, but that would have created a lot of friction, a lot of problems. Maybe she would have had an anger problem. We don't know all the things behind that, but certainly there was battle after that. And she might have said, maybe Jesus offered this to me because he didn't know who I was. Not after this conversation. She could go home and say, he knew who I was before he offered it and he still offered it. Isn't that a precious thing about the gospel? Jesus blows us all away, I think, with the profoundness of his presentation of the gospel in this passage. It's beautiful. It's powerful. It's convicting. And I know we could never expect to be par with Jesus as far as presenting the gospel goes, but I would encourage you always continue to study the gospel. Don't figure that I know the Romans road, the way of the masters, five spiritual laws. I'm set for evangelism for the rest of my life. Keep digging. The gospel is so deep, so vast, it's so simple, but you can continue to study in it and continue to be wowed by it as you study through it. And I would encourage you to do so. But we just looked at one missionary and I... Before you get scared, the next missionary is going to be a lot shorter. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to hurry through this. But we looked at the most incredible missionary of all time, the, the greatest missionary of all time. We're going to talk about the most unlikely missionary. And in chapter 4, it continues to tell of what this woman did. And verse 28 says, The woman then left her water pot, skipping a few things here, 
and went her way into the city and saith to the men, here we have the woman. And we have, again, the same outline we could use. She got the must. The must go to Sikar. I must go back. I must tell them. She didn't say it's done. She had the must Jesus had when he got here. And now we find her trip. It says the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city. By the way, you're either a missionary or you're a mission field in this world. There's only two types of people. Now, you may not be sharing, but you are a missionary if you know the gospel and you've received it. And you're a mission field if you don't. So that's the division we could make of all humanity. But she's now a missionary. And maybe she's not called full-time missionary, pastor's wife, you know. But she is going out to share the gospel because she has a newfound hope in her life and she wants to share it. It's interesting in this verse, however, that Jesus shares some interesting details that are kind of, uh, at first read, you kind of think it, it isn't necessary to mention. It says she left her water pot. And I, I often stop on those type of things and, and, and try to speculate and try to run over why he might say something like that. And I'll just run quick three thir- theories because our time is going on. But uh, one, she might have forgot about it. I mean, who hasn't forgot something they were doing and left something and then had to go back? But blessed is the person who forgets the physical things that they're doing in order to do something spiritual. Jesus is about to do it in a few verses later. The apostles, after I don't know how they were getting along with Samaritans buying the food earlier, I'm sure they were trying to avoid as many people as possible, and they're probably frustrated. They get out there with the food, and they offer it, and he says, I have food that you know not of. He lost his hunger because of a spiritual hunger in that moment. That's a blessed thing. If that's the case, well, praise the Lord for it. But she also could have left it because she knew she couldn't run with it. I think that makes a lot of sense, too. You can't run with a pot. If you've been to Mexico, we have got garrafones down there of water that you have to buy purified and you have to go refill them. And they're not lightweight things. So it would make sense that she would leave it. And if that's the case, my application would just be what Second Timothy says, what Paul says there to, to Timothy, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. You don't run with a water pot. If you want to be a missionary, there are things you need to set aside and just take off running. And a lot of us maybe need to set aside our water pot and dedicate ourselves to our children. Maybe we need to set aside a time and go to our neighbors. Set aside a time and go out on an outreach program from the church. Go to a mission trip with uh, MTT. Set aside your water pot. Whatever. I'll let the Holy Spirit apply. If if you have a water pot in your life, just pray he show it to you. And then I encourage you, drop it and run. But there's also another third reason. I'll... Just say it in passing. Maybe she left it as a sign she'll return. I mean, everybody that got back there would have said, she's coming back. How do you know, Peter? There's her water pot. She'll be back for that. When she gets thirsty, she'll remember. (laughs) But I think if we want to add an application there too, you don't go to Jesus and, and then you're done. People that say, oh, I accepted Christ 50 years ago, haven't been in church, haven't studied the Bible, haven't prayed. There's, there's something wrong there. You go back and back and back. In fact, in her presentation in a second, when we see this is her trip, we'll look down at her tactics later and, her, her, and we'll look at that in her target. But um, she's going to say, come see. She doesn't say, go see. She was planning on going back. So whether this is the case or not, I don't know. But I would say if, if there's any application the Holy Spirit has for you in any of those points, do what he asks. Her target, verse 28, says, And went her way into the city and saith to the men. Now, I don't know. I I speculated early on that maybe she was avoiding people at the middle of the day. I'm not sure if that's the case. But if that is the case, then this is pretty amazing. She was avoiding women. And now she's running in the middle of town and yelling to everybody. That's an obvious change in her life. She is expressing these things. She must have thought. It wasn't just a five five second walk to Sychar, she had to think along the way, they're going to think I'm crazy. There's going to be people who say, Jesus isn't going to appear to you. The Messiah, the last person in town he is going to appear to is you. But she doesn't care. At least from what we see here, she is more concerned with the burden, the flowing water, that those rivers of water are flowing through her, and she wants to share whether she is ostracized 
whether people make fun of her, reject her, she, she's going to do her part. And so we find her running into the middle. And Galatians 1.10, you don't have to look it up, but it says, For if I yet pleased men, I should not be a servant of Christ. We have to get that attitude too, if we're going to emulate this. Her tactic, finally. Verse 29, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? I don't know what your question would be if you were a Samaritan in those days, but I would be like, why is she happy? <laughs> Come see a man who knows my whole life, and you're happy because... Oh, by the way, that guy I think is the Messiah, and you're still happy? I mean, he's coming with a sword, that was their theory, to destroy all wicked doers, and you're telling me she know, he knows your life. But that's what makes it so striking. It's not really impressive what she says as far as you look at Jesus and he just pulled out this extremely amazing presentation. And all she has in this verse at least is a very quick uh, statement and a question. But that's all that was needed. That's all that's needed for this woman. She presents the Messiah and I think she said it with great joy. Come see a man that knows everything that I've done. And people must have wondered why. And I'll tell you why. The only reason you'd be happy saying that is if you knew the Lord knows everything you've done but's forgiven you. That's the reason you'd be happy. And might I say on the negative side, it's best you figure that one out in life. Because if you die, Today, not knowing Christ, you'll stand before him and you will learn he knows everything you've done. There's a woman a few chapters ahead who was caught in the act of adultery. Might I say he's caught you in the act of every sin you've ever done. And he has the right to cast the stone. And he will as a just judge. But we see her happy. And we see her present the gospel. And if we went on ahead, we'd see that the entire town comes out. I, I would love to see all of San Miguel turn to Christ, all of Arandas. I, 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 I need more faith, I guess. But I'll just say this. Probably this woman achieved more than I will in my entire life with a simple presentation. And might I just say in application that maybe today you've heard someone present the gospel along the way and, 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 and you're just like, I don't present the gospel that way. You look at Jesus, you're like, wow, but I'm nowhere near that. I sound like when you're learning how to drive standard, you know. I'd switch into gear one and gear two and it just sounds horrible as you're going through the gear, the car's flying back and forth. That's how my gospel presentation goes, Rolando. Well, I want to tell you this. This woman didn't know much and nor did the blind man a few chapters later. But they shared what God did in their life. And you may not be able to do great, I mean, as far as you judge. But maybe that's what God wants to use. And maybe this woman was used more than others just on the basis that she wouldn't take any of the glory for it. In the end, if I present an eloquent presentation of the gospel, I might walk away saying, yep, that was Rolando. And it may not do anything. And she walked away Simply sharing her faith. I would tell you if you've never gone out and shared the gospel, if you haven't done it with a friend or you know of someone you haven't talked to because you feel you're inadequate, so let, me, let, let me just say a lot of us missionaries have ran into that same thing and we feel like we, uh, there are days we, we feel like we can't express the gospel as we would and they walk away and you're like, I should have said that. I should have said this. But God's used many of those conversations and God has worked through them. And God can use you as well. I saw these two missionaries. And I hope that you would join the mission work as well here in this land. Because we stand on people's shoulders. There's another generation coming ahead of you here. Other missionaries across the world depending upon your prayers. And if you neglect the ministry here. Soon there will not be outreaches from this area to other places in the world. So keep on keeping on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to be able to study the greatest missionary of all who humbled himself, took on the form of a servant and as a servant he was obedient unto death and to death of a cross what a missionary example we have in him and yet somehow you choose to use the, the weak 
voices of humanity and the foolishness of the cross, at least as far as it goes for those who are perishing. You use the weak and the feeble to accomplish many things, Lord. I'm grateful for it because, Lord, many times I just stop and think, you can use rocks crying out. You could have thundering mountains preach your gospel. You could have angels present it. You could have a donkey preach it a whole lot better than I could. And yet, you've chosen to use us to be part of this great privilege to serve you. Thank you, Lord, for this church. I pray their hearts would continue to grow in missions and that they would see the mission in their own house and the full-time disciples you've given them and that you continue to bless as they continue to seek your will for this church, for their pastors, for their leaders, for their deacons, for each and every one of the people active in service, Lord, that you continue to bless them. For those who have come for the first time, Lord, and don't know you, that your your word would convict them and they wouldn't leave with the ease of a, of a heart that is lost, but they would be burdened as well. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.